This is the. Ask members of all mobile phones are set to airplane mode or silent or turned off. It's not sufficient to put them on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the assembly recording. This session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed via online streaming either on the assembly website or Democracy Live. Anyone in the gallery is welcome to use their mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and all devices are muted. They cannot, uh, sorry, they can connect to the assembly Wi-Fi and password details are available on the gallery rules. It is not permitted to take photographs or record any of the meeting. Okay, so uh, open session. Uh, apologies, have any apologies, members? Okay. Uh, the item two minutes of the meeting of the fifth of February two thousand twenty are pages five to ten. Um, members, please see the draft minutes of the. 20th of February meeting, pages 6 to 11. Are our members content with these draft minutes? Great. Great. <clears throat> Your permission to sign them. Item three, members, uh, matters arising. Last week, the auditing role of the Comptroller and Auditor General Kieran Donnelly was raised in respect to the Northern Ireland Electoral Office. I have since been advised that Kieran Donnelly has no rem remit for auditing the Northern Ireland uh, Electoral Office. Rather, this is the responsibility of the National Audit Office. Uh, and outside of his remit is the, as is the, the Human Rights Commission and the Parades Commission for Northern Ireland. Is that okay? I know Mr. Boylan, you'd raise this issue. Are you content with that? I, I am. Well, Chair. Maybe not. I, I, well, I'll, I'll follow on from that then. Obviously, um, as a committee in relation to the National Audit Office, we have no other responsibility other even to write that on. No, no committee, no. no responsibility at all. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, agenda item four. Declaration of members' interests. Members at each uh, meeting, members are required to register relevant financial and other interests uh, in the register of members' interests. Does any member have any interest they wish to declare this afternoon? No. Okay. Item five. Uh, correspondence or pages fourteen to forty. The first piece of correspondence is at pages fourteen to fifteen. Is the uh, Treasury Office of Accounts, Stuart Stevenson, dated the 21st of February 2020. This is in response to our letter sent on the 14th of February 2020, seeking clarification on the issues surrounding the update to the guidance of public, uh, managing public money and the guidance in relation to the parliamentary scrutiny of public spending. TOA proposes working with the Northern Ireland Audit Office, the PAC version of the revised 2015 HMT guidance titled Parliamentary Scrutiny of Spending. Members, are you content to note this response uh, and the proposal to produce the NI specific guidance? The members content? Great. 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 Members, the second piece of correspondence, page 16, is from Northern Ireland Audit Office, Audit Office in response to our letter dated the 10th of February 2020, seeking clarification on the points raised by uh, Dr. Edward Cook. Members, are you content with this response? Uh, and it is forwarded to Dr. Cook. Read. Read. Members, the third piece of correspondence, page 1718, is from the Northern Ireland Auto Office in response to our letter sent on the 10th of February 2020, seeking clarification on points raised by Mr. Paul Sayers. Members, the, the C and AG advises that the National Trust is a registered charity and falls outside his audit remit. In relation to Mr. Sayers' second point, due to time that has elapsed, i.e. 42 years. The information that um, Mr Sayers is looking for is no longer available in the Northern Ireland Audit Office, as all financial audit files are closed after five years and reviewed for disposal after ten. Members, are you content with this response and that it is forwarded to Mr Sayers? Great. Yes. Okay, agreed. Members, we will remain in open session for the next two uh, agenda items. Agenda item six is the inquiry into major capital projects uh, and the raised paper, uh, which is uh, being researched. And we would welcome Mr. Colin Pigeon, research officer from RAIS, who has compiled a research paper on the major capital projects. 
Members, please note that the raised paper is not in your, uh, your pack. Please refer to your blue table pack. It's in blue folder. Okay. Everyone have a tackle, okay, before we start. Mr. Pigeon, good afternoon. Very welcome, and I'll give you the floor. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to take you through line by line, obviously through the research paper, but because it's um, because it was done at, 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 in a relatively short time scale, it's in your table pack, so you probably haven't had time to to look at it in detail. Um, so I will I will just uh, highlight a number of uh, points about the briefing. Um, essentially, section one uh, just sets out initially what the current structure of Northern Ireland public procurement at the moment. Um, we have the central body, um, which used to be Central Procurement Directorate, but I notice has now changed to Central uh, no, Construction, Procurement and Delivery, um, same initials, which is part of the Department of Finance. Um, and then there are a number of centres of procurement expertise spread across different departments. Um, we also have the, the addition, which you don't see in Scotland and, and uh, the Republic of Ireland, of, of this body called the Strategic Investment Board, which has a role in, particularly in large projects. Um, so, if we turn to page five, um, really, what, what I've done there is just highlighted uh, a couple of issues from the recent Northern Ireland Order Office report. Um, into major capital projects, um, and, and obviously this report highlights uh, there have been some problems with cost overruns and also with time delays in projects. Um, but I thought it was also useful to take a look back because, um, from having worked in research for ten years now, and or eleven years or something in the assembly, some of these things don't strike me as new. Um, so I looked back and I did find some, some older reports, um, even in fact going back to 2005, which noted that projects were routinely delivered over budget and behind schedule, which isn't uh, entirely dissimilar from the current uh, finding. So there have been issues, obviously, with public procurement going back some time. There have been reforms. Some of them have been, been implemented, obviously. Um, but the, but the, the, the current report takes us to the point where uh, it recommends looking at alternative models of, of delivery and exploring those. Um, so I was asked then to have a look at Scotland and Ireland, particularly, um, on the basis that uh, I think the CBI had recommended that previously in a report that they had done. So um, that's what the next couple of sec sections of the report do, or the paper, rather. First of all, looking at the Republic of Ireland. Um, which, starting at page eight, just sets out really that the, the case for re procurement reform in Ireland was driven primarily by uh, wanting to save money uh, in the wake of the financial crisis and the retrenchment of the Irish state. Um, so there are a number of uh, centralisation reforms, um, ending up with a, an Office of Government uh, Purchasing, which sets the overall policy framework in a similar way to the Department of Finance's CPD does. Um, and then there are a number of uh, sectoral sourcing bodies um, with specialist expertise in defence or health or, or, and so on. Um, so in terms of what impact this has had, uh, the OGP has, has reported savings of over 300 million euro uh, during the, the what are we now? Nearly six years since it's been running, um, and obviously that's a significant amount of money. Um, but I do I do have a point of caution to note about that, um, which I pick up on later in the paper, which talks about how governments report efficiency savings uh, in relation to procurement and other issues. Um, so I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, when uh, the Scots began to reform their system. Um, I mean, it's really been ongoing for a long time. And they have something not entirely dissimilar from, from in Northern Ireland as well, where they have a, a central government body and then some sectoral bodies. Um, but I think the key is perhaps that there are slightly fewer, um, in the same as there are in the Republic of Ireland, slightly fewer bodies than perhaps there are in Northern Ireland, relative to the sizes of the, 
countries. Perhaps the, the, there's something in that. Um, so the Scottish uh, case for reform is also built on efficiency, maximising efficiency and, and, um, and saving money. Uh, but there's the addition then that, that part of what they they are trying to achieve is what they call a fairer Scotland. Um, so there's a slightly, there's a social element to that as well, um, which you don't notice from reading the papers in the, uh, relating to the Republic of Ireland reforms. Um, so, as I said, the Northern Ireland Law Office is recommending looking at alternative models. Um, Scotland and, and the Republic of Ireland have, have undertaken some centralisation. That's backed up actually by the OECD, or Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, which has recommended um, a centralisation process. Um, but I think the, the, um, the, the key bit of any of, of um, this, and in fact, I think, Mr Chairman, you might have been in the Finance Committee at the time that this evidence session was I tried taken. To, I, I try to forget my time in the Finance Committee. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I remember it anyway. <coughs> um, and uh, they, they, they had a, a, sh <coughs> a, a short inquiry, or a, um, a preliminary inquiry, I think, into public section, sector efficiencies. And um, the bit that really stuck in my mind was when Professor Talbot uh, explained that HMRC had claimed efficiency savings of £650 million during a, a reform initiative programme efficiency savings, but at the same time they had managed to lose over £7 billion in overpayments and £2 billion in underpayments. So although, yes, they had made cash uh, efficiency savings, they had also uh, had a catastrophic failure of systems, um, the legacy of which lasted for many, many years. Um, so I think it's important, um, and really I suppose the key point of anything that's in this paper would be, I think, if, if the committee gets to a point where it is minded to recommend that there are reforms, that it's important to establish right at the start how, what, what the baseline is for any savings that are to be delivered. Is it a reasonable baseline? Is it a fair baseline? And how are those savings uh, going to be measured and counted? Because um, if we look back to the uh, sorry the, the guidance which the OGP delivers um, sorry prepared for for departments in in Ireland. They say specifically that purchasing, where purchasing systems are in use in the public sector, which implies that they're not everywhere, um, they do not in the main enable tracking by price and volume that is required to measure actual efficiency savings effectively. So necessarily the implication of that is that any savings are estimated. Um, and a similar approach actually <coughs> applies in Scotland as well, where there is a, there's a process of, of trying to establish a, a benchmark for where you were but it, particularly in the relation to um, looking at cost overruns in major capital projects, if you're going to establish what a saving is and on the basis that there is usually cost overruns or time delays or both, you would have to establish a counterfactual in effect to say that what has happened isn't what would have happened had you not reformed, if you see what I mean, so you're working backwards and trying to construct what the position would have been in a different world from the one you actually inhabit, um, which inevitably is going to have some difficulties. Um, so on that slightly convoluted way of, of explaining that, um, I'll, I'll <coughs> sit, and if there are any okay. questions, I'm happy to take them. Colin, thank you very much. Um, just looking at your figures there, the savings in the Republic of Ireland were 300 million euros. Yeah. The savings in Scotland, two billion. Yeah. Uh, obviously, significant savings, uh, and obviously in terms of the size of the countries. But the equivalent, do you know what the over the most time the time periods? Do you know the equivalent savings that CPD delivered for Northern Ireland for the public purse? Y you mean we know what equivalent? Do we know? No, I, I don't. I don't know that. I didn't look for it actually. Right, okay. um, uh, in terms of of the sort of frameworks and, and uh, no, I didn't look for that, but I could certainly... Could, could, could I ask you to look at that? Because yeah. um, one of the things that uh, I will come across, even from being a school governor, 
is that sometimes I feel that um, CPD is actually an impediment to delivering efficiency. Where, where people within, a government, in the, within government uh, have to go to the Central Procurement Directorate, or whatever its new uh, evolutionary title is, uh, before they engage a contractor. Mm -hmm. That not, not, not necessarily brings you the uh, savings that uh, perhaps um, might, you might think would come out of that. Yeah. Uh, and I am not so sure, to be honest. And I remember making this point when I when I was on PEDU, the finance committee to, to the PEDU people. Mm -hmm. That and I'm not sure it's any better nowadays. But if you're able to produce some figures that prove me wrong, I'll be. I'll be pleased. Well, it, they wouldn't be my figures, of course, but I can go and look and see what yeah. CPD have produced, certainly, yeah. and I'll, I'll, um, I'll feed them back to the, to the yeah. committee. Yep. Yeah, that, that would be good. Thank you. Yeah. Mr Beggs. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, in your investigation in this area, have you come across the scale of project whereby efficiencies can occur? Because, like uh, the chairman, I've come across issues at uh, schools. For instance, school want to repaint a classroom. Um, quote thousand pounds from a couple of local contractors and Department of Education. Their contractors two or three thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. I mean that's fairly common. Mm -hmm. uh, so at what point uh, are you aware of what point does centralisation bring about efficiencies? Because certainly by pushing smaller projects towards centralisation approach is bringing about inefficiencies. Um, well, certainly the, the usually. There would be for frameworks and so on. They they would apply to to a threshold, and um, there's the threshold obviously that that exists within the European procurement framework. Um, I can't remember exactly what that is. I think it used to be fifty thousand euro, but it but it may be that it's um, it may have increased from that now. I I, I can't remember. Um, and once the implementation or the so it's not called an implementation period anymore. Once the, once the Brexit transition period is over, that, that will cease to be necessarily the case. Um, but irrespective of whether it's a centralised um, CPD framework, it could also be a framework that's created by um, the uh, Education Authority, for example. Um, but. There, there are some reasons for doing that, and I, might, I remember reading uh, about situations back in, in um, the past with schools where, pe where uh, people from the boards of governors were employing their relatives to do a paint job. Now, that may, it may have been cheaper, but part of the, the process of, uh, of centralisation means you have a standardised quality control and you, you have... Um, <coughs> You have certain standards that have to be met because before suppliers can get onto, uh, for memory, before they can get onto the register of 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 suppliers, they have to meet certain standards in mm. terms of their their quality controls, in terms of their processes, and so on, um, which may not necessarily be the case from from a painter yeah. and decorator down the road. I, I think example. I think that's that's a fair point, and um, quality control, insurance, uh, and those other issues, but I think. But part of the problem is that with the smaller contractors, uh, the, the, the view out there is, and I still think it is out there, uh, that uh, how do you get into this close shop? Mm -hmm. You know, that that's part of the difficulty. Yeah, you and know, I think that has always suppose, been an issue. Yeah, and I'm not suggesting yeah. you're suggesting, but we shouldn't yeah. suppose that people because they um, aren't in that don't meet all those no, regulations either. Absolutely. And they, you know, and I, and I think. Um, you know, often the criticism is that that, that, that small contractors cannot get in, mm. uh, and I think that that is something which needs to be looked at. But mm. um, and equally, perhaps if we could look at you know what is the bottom rung in terms of in in the Republic of Ireland and in Scotland, if we're if those are the comparatives that we're looking at for people to become contractors and so on, is there is there a threshold in? As in under five yeah. thousand, under ten thousand. Yeah, it, 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 will, it will vary as well, depending yeah. on the nature of the. Surely, it, obviously, it because the, this yeah. this report is about about major capital projects. Yeah. So, so it will only be the larger players that have a certain amount of turnover yeah. that no, are able that. to, you know, and they've yeah. got a proven capacity of being yeah. able to deliver um, infrastructure rather than the smaller scale sort of service contracts. Yeah. Um, okay, Mr. Hillage. Thanks, Chair and Colin. Thanks for your presentation. 
Uh, your, your report indicates that the current report that we're looking at is really not the first time this has been raised. It's been raised previously as well over mm -hmm. a period of time, and some recommendations have accompanied those reports. Has, were those recommendations acted on, or have they been ignored? Or what, what has been the blockage that we are still at where we are today in 2019-20, uh, still losing large amounts of money and still being over over time on budget yeah. um, projects? I, what, what, what is, I actually don't know. Yeah. Um, the, the issue is really when the Audit Office makes a report it, it reports to the Public Accounts Committee and then there's a process of agreeing the report with the, the Department recommendations are made and then the, there's, there's an issue of then following up and the Departments then um, will, will report on how they've implemented the recommendations. I understand it. I mean, that's the same process as when the Finance Committee here did its big review of public procurement in 2010-11 um, and there was a series of recommendations, many of which were indeed um, implemented and have been reported on and there's a series of sort of follow-ups um, but as to whether I mean changes must have been made I'm sure um, because I don't think it's the departments don't ignore recommendations but but whether they have I mean if we look back at the 2005 report modernizing construction procurement in Northern Ireland um, it, it uh, found some good practice, but also noted um, projects are routinely delivered over budget and behind schedule, which is exactly the same complaint. So uh, now it may be for different reasons. Fifteen years I don't down know. the road, we're yeah. still at it. Well, it, yeah, the, but the projects are, are different and may have different problems. Yeah. Um, uh, I, but beyond that, I can't really comment. Yeah. Did you did you think maybe I know you on uh, Ireland and Scotland, but. Would you have thought maybe of trying to look at some of the continental countries as well? Um, well, I, I, I was directed to look at these, right. these two. I suppose one of the one of the issues is that um, the CBI had recommended um, these countries as, as sort of best practice, and they, uh, particularly the CBI, would have some sort of foothold in in throughout these islands. So, has some experience of working with the different bodies. So, I suppose that that was on the basis of of that. Yeah. Report. Okay. Mr. Hillage, I think your first question may be one that um, could be directed to Mr. Donnelly as well. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Next. Um, okay, I have no other indications. Remember. Sorry, Chair. Just one. Okay. Hey, thank you, and thank you very much for for your presentation. <coughs> so just, a, and you know, we only got the papers today, so so bear with me. Yeah. Um, there's a paragraph here on optimum bias. Would you like to? Can you expand a wee bit more on that? Oh, optimism bias. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so when when uh, a departmental official prepares a business case for um, a, an expenditure, they have to look at the economic cost and impact, and part of that calculation then is an adjustment for what they call optimism bias, which is based on research which shows that. Um, government officials are routinely over optimistic yeah. about how quickly and how cheaply things can be can be done so you, so you adjust your cost estimate and in effect you increase it um, to allow for the fact that that you have been over optimistic um, and what I suppose the reference to it there is that this is used in in business <coughs> cases um, but I wonder does does optimism bias potentially exist in terms of reporting the savings as well? That's really what I was thinking about. No, and, and yeah, I, yeah. I understand what yeah. it is. I'm just trying to expand yeah. it because I mean, it's something sure. maybe there was a question you can ask. Obviously, well, I mean, it's it's something that maybe we need to look at because I know we've been through previous programmes or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's maybe an issue we need to interrogate a wee bit further. But I appreciate the point. Thank you, okay. <coughs> okay. Mr. Bridget. Thanks very much. Thanks. Okay. Welcome. Okay, members, um, we'll continue in open session. Item 7, inquiry into major capital projects. The introduction to the briefing is at page 20. Members, the inquiry into major capital projects is the first inquiry the Public Accounts Committee will undertake. The briefing will begin in open session, and then we will move into closed session to deal with the detail of issues in advance of formal evidence session next week. Uh, it is preferable that I would ask members um, if they can indicate to, to us now, to the clerk in particular, 
if they're available to attend next week's meeting. Members all available, as far as I know. DV, okay. So, uh, would welcome at this point Mr. Kieran Donnelly, Controller and uh, Auditor General for Northern Ireland, Mr. Kelly Begum, Mr. Emily Sport, Mr. Thomas Wilkinson, Director. Um, members, we move into closed session for the next item. Uh, so, uh, on to you now. Uh, Chair, if I could ask Mr. Wilkinson, sure. who led on this report, then to give you okay. a brief overview of the findings. Yeah. Thanks very much. I'll just give you a quick overview um, of what's in the report. Um, the, the public sector in Northern Ireland invests an average of £1.5 billion pounds every single year on improving public infrastructure. So it's therefore extremely important that this money is spent properly. We're going to hear later how the construction industry relies heavily on getting work from the public sector and how delays in getting projects on the ground are affecting the construction industry and in some cases causing them to, to look to work elsewhere. In, the, in our report, we've looked at 11 of the very, very largest projects over the last seven years and find that in, in every case there's been some degree of cost overrun or delay. In fact, in several of the projects, the, the, the overrun or the delay was very significant. And it's while we recognise that there will, you know, these large building and infrastructure works are very risky, inherently risky, and they're difficult to manage, it's important that proper structures and expertise are in the right places within the public sector to give the best possible chance of success um, and to be able to manage the risk. In our report, we have appendices in the report which give more, some more detail on the issues arising in each of the 11 reports that we looked at, or 11 projects we looked at. However, for this briefing, we're not going to concentrate on the individual uh, projects, but rather look at the reasons the overruns generally happened um, and how the structures and responsibilities for procurement and project management can be improved. So, from the 11 projects that we looked at, we were able to identify the main reasons behind the cost and time overruns as falling into a number of categories. Um, planning issues and legal issues have caused big delays in certain projects, like the likes of Casement Park um, and the A5, which, is now, which has been the subject of three separate judicial reviews, some of which are ongoing. Um, uncertainties around funding are another key issue in, in delays. Um, and to some extent, that's been tried to be tackled with the, uh, the flagship uh, projects, which have multi-year funding. Um, uh, although I suppose they've had limit, our, our report shows that even that has had limited success. Another problem that arises is, is um, construction issues that arise during the build, where they, there are problems with the, the, the build itself, um, and that has to, you know, that causes considerable delay when the contractor has to go back and fix the work um, and, you, and things like that. You think of the, the, the critical care centre where there were significant issues which caused a large amount of delay um, in it. And also the, the problems with building um, were also contributed to the University of Ulster. Um, that's a key part of where things started to go wrong, at least, in it. Um, and then finally, a lack of contractor interest. Sometimes um, it's not possible to properly procure the work where there's not enough people coming forward to, to try to procure the, or to try to gain the work, um, as has been the case with the Struhl campus. Um, and it is the job of the, the departments themselves, of SIB and CPD, to ensure that they're drumming up as much interest as possible and they're, that they're getting uh, interest uh, in these, products, uh, these big projects. Uh, the current structure then of responsibilities in the public sector, as you heard earlier, it's widely dispersed. Really, with departments having a considerable degree of responsibility, the procurement board, um, which the head of the civil service sits on, with, with other um, other permanent secretaries, the uh, strategic investment board, the department of finance, uh, and the construction and procurement division, all having a role. So it's quite well dispersed uh, in terms of skills, and. That, to some extent, leads to departments sometimes working in silos and important skills and expertise being spread right across the public sector uh, and not necessarily available in the right place at the right time. There have been, we, we look at, there, there are three reports um, which you've already heard about to some extent over the last seven years, which have pointed out that the structures within the public sector 
where the procurement and delivery of these large projects are not fit for purpose and need to be overhauled. The key report was one done. The key report we looked at was one done by SIB uh, on behalf of the procurement board in 2013, which recommended moving towards a centralised model of delivery, so that the expertise and resources could be concentrated in the one place, and to help reduce costs uh, and improve delivery. And that was emphasised then by further reports by the CBI and the OECD a couple of years later, which also recommended moves towards a centralised procurement and delivery agency. The SIB report was agreed by the Procurement Board in 2014 and had an action plan put in place to tr start to deliver on the recommendations, but the plan wasn't actioned for various reasons. Um, and in the main, um, the recommendations at this stage haven't, have never been fully implemented. So finally, uh, in our report, we've endorsed the recommendations uh, that were made initially by SAB. However, we're not prescriptive about how to do it. Um, we recommend that the, the benefits of an alternative uh, procurement and delivery model are, are explored by the public sector as a matter of priority. Thank you very much. Um, can I just ask, you mentioned 11 major projects. Yes. Could, could you give us a total of the overspend on those 11 uh, major projects in terms of the uh, Northern Ireland spend? Well, that, that, yeah. That's not something we did in the report. Right, okay. uh, we didn't include that figure in the right. report. Um, I think it's been reported since as you know, £700 million. Or, £700 million? Pounds. I think that's been reported. So in the context, and I, I won't hold you to that, yeah. but if it's £700 million, pounds, in the context of the black hole, the finance minister says that there is in the potentially in the budget. Here we have £700 million pounds potentially spent across uh, a range of major projects in Northern Ireland, uh, which has a cost of £700 million pounds and also an opportunity cost to where that money could have been spent as well. Can I just ask a couple of questions there? In terms of um, CPD, is it fair to ask, do you, do you think that CPD actually does provide value for money and delivers efficiencies and cost savings for Northern Ireland? Um, Chair, that's a wider question yes. than just about capital yes, projects. I appreciate that because I was touched on in the yes, earlier yes. session. Uh, we actually plan to do a further piece of work it's in our forward programme, a strategic review of CPD and how it works. Uh, now, we had an earlier report um, oh, four or five years ago on uh, collaborative procurement and what savings were achieved, I suppose, at uh, you know, bulk, bulking up contracts across the pu public sector. Uh, and uh, to be honest, what we did find at that time, their systems for actually capturing savings uh, were not very good. We had to do quite a bit of work ourselves. So, whilst uh, CPD and its pre predecessors uh, were established many, many years ago with a view to achieve savings, uh, there's maybe less focus on that particular angle in recent years. Uh, there were other arguments for centralisation, such as uh, the complexity of EU rules, that uh, rather than everybody trying to interpret this, it would be better to have centralisation. Uh, so, um, your question is much wider than, than this report. Now, uh, some things, uh, one arm of CPD will do the construction side, the, the major things, uh, and uh, one thing that uh, was implemented uh, was uh, bringing together, uh, I suppose, the health service side and the civil service side, but a critical mass. Now, when we talk uh, about centralisation uh, and our thinking, it's not just about savings, it's about skills, expertise, streamlining. Northern Ireland's a very small place, uh, and I suppose what we're saying, we've got a very, very complicated structure here. Uh, we're not going to be prescriptive on how, how it's fixed, but uh, and lots of others are saying, well, it, it's too convoluted for a small place like this. So it's not just about savings, it's about skills, expertise, and pace of, mm. of movement. Okay. <coughs> Can I? I was just going to say, I, th I think in relation to CPD, then, you, know, you would see the sa where it tends to make the savings would be in the larger amounts of expenditure, you know, bigger projects. Um, I, I, 
and we do see in, in some of the smaller um, amounts of spending in, you know, in FE colleges and, uh, and places like that, you know, that it, it is difficult to use CPD <coughs> for some cases. I, I absolutely appreciate on, on, on the 11 projects you're talking about, some of them are still live and the costs are still being uh, incurred there. But could I ask you if, you, if you wouldn't mind, to provide us with a figure up to today, I'm not asking <coughs> you to do it today, mm -hmm. but in the very near future, of, across those 11 projects of the cost that there has been to the public purse in Northern Ireland in terms of overspend uh, yeah. for, for some stage in the near future. Mm -hmm. The last point that you made, Mr Donnelly, is a point that I would agree with entirely in terms of, um, I think, a, a lack of efficiency and perhaps uh, over-governed in some of these things. And I know you didn't use that term. I'm suggesting that. In terms of um, when you, you listen to the presentation that Mr Wilkinson made in terms of departments and then you've got the procurement board and then you've got the strategic investment board, can there not be in a situation where perhaps there are too many cooks in a scenario and too many experts? So in some cases it looks as if there are none um, and therefore there is wastage. And then in other cases we have an argument of, of the silo mentality and there isn't enough working across government, which, is an, which actually is something which we need to improve massively and I would agree with the point you made. Uh, Chair, that's cer certainly there's potential for too many players on, on the pitch. Uh, and I suppose what, what's important in, on the delivery side, uh, major capital projects, is uh, sharp accountability, uh, which means good project management. Uh, and of course, uh, they're, they're senior project officers for, for projects, so it takes us into the whole arena of skills and, 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 and capacity and uh, streamline. So, um, and not every, let's say, uh, you have some relatively small public sector bodies, maybe doing a major project once every 10 years, uh, they need support. And we've been here before uh, in, in previous case studies. Uh, for example, uh, we did a report oh, a number of years ago on uh, it was the old decal department's capital projects, uh, and that department just wasn't geared up, didn't have the skills to do this sort of thing, and that's where the, the, ex the specialist expertise is, is, is so mm. important. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr Hildich? Yes, sir, thank you. Um, I suppose going back to the question that he asked Colin, had he any observations when he was doing his um, research? Historically, we've had a few reports in Thomas, you have alluded to them there, uh, and particularly in probably the 2014 one, the CBI was it? There was a number of agreed recommendations, but, but nothing enacted. Mm -hmm. As I say, we're, we're some six years down the road from that and still not learning the lessons. Why, why would that not have been enacted upon at that stage? Well, I th if in, in the report, I think it, it's, we say that um, there was an action plan. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that was put in place for to do this, but um, it, there wasn't. It wasn't able to get full agreement with the executive um, at the time, and it it was never just would never got to the point of being implemented. Um, and then when the the executive was suspended, um, it has nothing has moved since then. So there was a political. That's <coughs> yes. I, I think that's what it says in the report to it as well. That no? yep. executive. Thank you. Um, I tell you that most of these projects will go through like central planning. They're not local planning issues. They're come to the central planning, the Department of Finance. Would that be right? Um, sorry, in terms of um, for planning applications, there's criticism of planning issues that are at large here as well, um, and uh, delay. Well, but that it goes to a more central planning. Okay. Well, 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 some of these planning issues go right away back uh, when before devolution of planning to to councils. Yeah. Um, I suppose there is an issue then of the the role of the the department on major major projects. Uh, so it's not just a, a council thing. Uh, now, Con Pigeon talked about uh, what's these problems exist elsewhere. Uh, um, uh, as a, in the Republic of Ireland, there, there's certainly been a move to, I suppose, fast track, uh, I suppose, major planning issues of strategic importance 
So that, that's a debate that uh, could be had. Uh, I did a report 10 years ago when the planning <coughs> service here uh, came to the, your predecessors, uh, and the big theme uh, was uh, how, how can we move faster on uh, major, m major planning applications mm. of strategic importance to, to Northern Ireland? Yeah. I think it's something that we need to look at at some stage as, as mm -hmm. an angle, but mm -hmm. encoded here as a delay in some circumstances. Yeah. Okay, David. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Lund. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks to Matt for your words. Um, I'm looking at the last two major reasons for, for problems. One of them is limited interest from the construction industry, and the other is issues with the quality of construction. Now, take, take the second one first. Uh, does that mean quality workmanship that, that would have to be tidied up during the maintenance period? Or does it mean quality of materials? Or does it mean faulty uh, tender document or faulty pricing? Well, what does it mean? It's construction problems, as in uh, problems with the building, of the, so be the building materials or the building work that has been done. Yeah, well, I know that. But the, so, what's the. Is, is it because uh, inferior products were specified? In the, in the original bill, or is it because the contractor didn't do his work properly? So I'm wondering how it falls in the yeah. public purse. Well, I think, for example, in, in, if you take, for example, the critical care centre, yeah. uh, it, the, the issues with that arose in 2012, just before it was about to be completed. The contractor had to fix those costs, uh, fix those work at their own expense, yeah. so there was no extra expense to the public purse from that. Yes. But it meant there was a two and a half year delay before the critical care centre was completed, mm -hmm. and because there was a two and a half year delay in the critical care centre being completed, NHS standards had moved on, and there had to be more work and more work and more work done to, to bring it up to date. <laughs> so, although the, the cost was met by the contractor, it still <coughs> caused a huge amount of delay. Yes. Okay, and the, the other one, the limited interest from the construction industry, it, it fascinates me that every time. And I was talking to the construction industry, they're really aching big time about the lack and the delay and major contracts coming through. And yet, as from your research, there's actually limited interest. Now I'm thinking, is, is, that, is that because there's not enough major contractors now? Because an awful lot of them have gone by the board. Or is it because, in part, that they frankly can't be bothered with the convoluted system that we're talking about? I mean, it could cost. And don't ask me for a figure, but give one. It could cost hundreds of thousands of pounds to prepare a tender mm -hmm. for some of these big ones. And I, I can't help thinking that some of them feel, well, <coughs> if we're not likely to get this, we won't tender. It is, it is as simple as that. I think that's, there's some truth in that. I think they would have concerns as well. If you take Struel as the, as a, the best example of yeah. that. Yeah. You know, was the funding in place to actually? Was this project actually going to go ahead? Did you go through the whole tendering process? But, but there was some uncertainty as to the but the funding being available uh, for this. Add to that then that the you know the, the, the construction industry has have it's more straightforward perhaps to do business elsewhere in in, in GB or in yeah. Republic. That was the next one. The, the, the uh, fine uh, greener fields uh, abroad. Yeah. I think I think some of the big ones are across in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Is um, the Strail one? There's only one contractor in the end, wasn't there? One there, tender. There were two, and then but one pulled out, so there's only one contractor. <coughs> See, that, that just amazes me, Chairman, that a contract to build six schools on mm. one site, uh, and there should be that level of interest. Mm. I mean, well, where are we coming to? And then, you know, it, it's you say it, maybe the contractor are worried about the funding position. It's not really their problem, is it? I mean, if they're asked to tender, there must be a reasonable expectation that the contract will go ahead. Mm -hmm. And you know, and you know, one six schools spread across the whole province. It's slightly different things six schools in one site. I would have thought, in terms of efficiency and scale and all the rest, but that, that's a that's a juicy one. That there should be interest in that. But yeah, there's only the two. I think they were asked to pre-tender, so they were asked to declare their interest and then go ahead to full tender. And, and I think that I, the uncertainty of it going forward to full tender, mm -hmm. I think, then has meant one of them pulled out. Well, like the, the, they've actually been proved right in a way, haven't they? Because it's <laughs> just not a brick been laid except for the, the special school, which was an mm -hmm. emergency situation. Yeah. There we go, Chairman. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair. 
Tomás, thank you very much. Um, any food for thought? I mean, it's, I, as even I listened to the last presentation, I mean, in reading through some of the notes, um, compl really complicated business, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at you, 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 know, you put forward a business case, you go through a procurement, you go through tender, pre-tender, and everything else. Besides the question about the construction quality, which is way down at the, the other end of it, and it's interesting that Kieran, you're saying about the having enough players on the pitch. You know, have we the right players? Would be a question to ask first and foremost. If, if you, if you're saying to me, you know, we, we may not have enough. Um, because you all know, any of us who's had any work done, we, you you know, and I asked earlier about the optimum bias. I mean, no matter if you get an extension built or house, anybody you've talked to, anybody in the construction, there's always an overrun of some description. Yeah. And you can put that down at a certain percentage on average throughout the year, right across the industry. <coughs> but but in in this case here, as I listen to what you're saying, I mean, um, through procurement, there seems to be a number of obstacles in the way. There seems to be a lack of expertise. Although we're going to have a, a presentation by the, the industry and we'll, we'll tease out some of that, but it seems the bar in some cases is set too high for people to bid, and maybe it is, maybe the capacity isn't there. So, I mean, just trying to food for thought. Just maybe to qualify that a bit, uh, some projects are delivered on cost and time, right. uh, and particularly those that are standard projects. Mm -hmm. So uh, we take some like schools where they're all much the same. There's a better performance there than some of the one-off unique projects. That's because there's potential for repetition and, and, and people are used to dealing with budgets and, and billing um, <coughs> billings of a certain scale, yes? Uh, and there's a, a well-established skills base mm, yeah. uh, that can deal with them and they're, they're dealing with these type of things year in, year out. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I suppose just to add to, to that, I mean, just to be, to be fair, um, you do see some, uh, as TNAG says, there are some that do come in and there was like there, the Ulster Hospital, I think, came in pretty much on time and on budget and the work it had done. And there are some roads as well. Um, but it's, it was, it's an awful lot don't, but there are some do. Mm. No, and, and I'm not arguing that point, Chair. I'm, only, I'm looking at what, what we've been given <coughs> to get the system better and to look at improving the system. Uh, I, th I think there's two parts there. Um, we can look at problems once... Uh, you know, the, the yeah, diggers yeah. are in sight, uh, those yeah. construction problems. Uh, road projects tend to be pretty okay uh, once the contractor's in sight. Uh, the problems are at the, the other end, um, uh, at the planning and uh, the design stage. So it's a different set of problems there. So, so there's different types of problems yeah. in no, different types of and, projects. And as as members of different committees, certainly the issues of planning is definitely one. Yep. Um, but again, you said one other time in, in the previous report about the if you know naturally if you win as the lowest bidder and then I mean or the, the lowest bidder is awarded the contract, um, there's going to be an element to, to overspend, <coughs> overrun. I mean, and is that down to the competitiveness of our people? As like Tomas said. Um, there's no interest in going in in the first place, maybe because of the pre-tender process or the, the full tender process? Or? Yeah, there can be, uh, there be no interest in going into the process for, because of the pre-tender process, because there's no belief that it maybe is going to actually happen. Um, in terms of cost, I think it was, it's an essential that, you know, whatever figure is, is agreed for um, has to be a realistic um, cost that it's capable of being built for. You know, any, any procurement will have to be sure that that's the case. In terms of your saying about experts and too many experts, it's, a, it's to have the experts in the right place at the right time to do all the right project, say, you, know, the, you know, the right players on the field at the right time. I mean, the right, and in the right place, yeah. yeah. And, just, and just commenting on, would you like to comment on the optimum bias? If you were? Uh, no, I would agree with Colin Pigeon. Those are optimum, optimism yeah, yeah. bias has been a recurrent problem, not just here but elsewhere. Uh, and uh, recognised by economists when, when business case advice is put forward, that there's an alliance made for it. So it, it's well, well recognised in the, in the business. Projection and a protection at the same time, possibly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just something I'd like to say. Optimum bias then relate to the percentage of the, the overall cost of the project, like a 10%, is it? Yeah, uh, 
uh, I don't know if the actual I percentages of my fingertips. I, I, know, I don't but either, but uh, I very from think project to project. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thank McHugh. I was going on. I got to ask for any of the right to thank you for your presentation. Uh, so, so many of the issues are so interrelated uh, in, in many ways, I think. And uh, looking we'll see now at the A5 in particular, uh, that uh, while it was planning issues and then a, the legal issues that have compounded the difficulties and the problems there, and I often ask myself the question, you know, do we ever get to the stage of whereby even in running, we'll say, uh, the status such that we say you have one bite, two bites, three bites at the cherry, but then really things have to go on, you know, and I don't know whether or not uh, there's any room for improvement there whenever we look at uh, issues like that in terms of um, the different types of uh, objections that we've had right along the line uh, in relation to the A5, and that whenever one was exhausted through the court, all of a sudden they pull another one out of the hat and come forward again with another consultation. Um, but in addition, I can totally un, uh, understand and appreciate why it is that the contractors and themselves uh, are very, very reluctant we'll say, to tender in the first instance, that given we'll say, the cost of a tender, and then the likelihood, the likelihood that uh, it might never come to fruition, uh, given uh, these types of objections that we get along the way, uh, that in itself is such a deterrent. Now, uh, another issue just that was coming to mind there, as we talked about, when we refer to capacity, and so many of our major deliverers in terms uh, of those involved in construction have now gone to Scotland or to England or Wales or wherever the work is actually happening, mm -hmm. uh, that whenever they do go there too, they actually are employing probably locally. So if we find ourselves here now uh, in the north of Ireland that there is going to be a time oh. lag there not in terms of the expertise at the higher level, but at that other level, i.e. in terms of the vocational skills that are required uh, by young people coming through our colleges and the likes of it, uh, that will find that they haven't trained in specific skills because the work opportunities are not there. The construction firms have actually gone to Britain uh, and taken up their contracts and that there, which sort of more or less uh, emphasises just how important it is for us uh, to have um, a system that will accommodate um, both tendering and uh, allowing um, then subcontractors within that to meet standards that whereby they can sort of encourage the member to ask a question. Yeah, can I achieve it. So I often wonder to myself, uh, is there anything there that, that one can suggest that might allow us to address many of those issues in there like that? You want to go yeah, first? Go first yeah. Yeah. Um, the SIB has a system in place which is supposed to uh, publish the pipeline of work that is coming down the track um, so that um, contractors can see that and can bid for that and plan for that. And, uh, in recent years, there certainly hasn't worked as well as it should. And I think the um, construction industry would say it's a bit um, unrealistic um, on the pipeline. So, but if that was more reliable, then that would allow, uh, and, and, and the, co the contracts were actually happening and taking place, that would allow the industry to plan and to plan for where it's going to have its its workers, etc., uh, in place. Because it is difficult now. I think the SIB would recognise that like, there's so many working in other countries that it's that when the pipeline comes, it tries to be turned up again. Mm -hmm. the, the workers aren't necessarily available um, to do that. Um, and the other question you had, I think, was about judicial judicial, <coughs> judicial review and yeah. objections. Uh, I think um, we in my office we, we intend to do a bit of further work around this, um, looking at how does the judicial review process work here compared to other places, um, and uh, the, the threshold for, for taking cases. Uh, anecdotally, I suppose we hear that some, uh, maybe a project stops because there's a review. The review is not upheld, and so um, now we hear from elsewhere sometimes projects may go on while uh, a hearing is is live. So there's lots of issues around that that could be explored. Okay, thank you, Mr. Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Um, I would say is it not down to estimates? 
not being accurate, um, too competitive rates, facing the things too cheap, not allowing for the complications to so get the jobs. Like I say. There could, it's, it, there, there could be a, a, a belief that perhaps at the beginning of projects, you know, there's a tendency for departments to get things over the line, <coughs> get them approved, to put in a, a bid, which is, is is maybe lower than, than expected, um, and that, that that may be part of the reason why, when you compare to what the actual final outturn is to outline business cases, why um, maybe more, but there, but there, it's it's. It's a it's a part of a reason. It's def, you know there definitely are other issues right. there. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Would, would it be a case that um, I think that's what you were alluding to that that markets are international now because of the because of the the, the internet and that makes you know, countries much closer, projects much more um, readily accessible in terms of quotations and and um, bids and so on. Would would that international internationalisation of the market be an impediment now, not just here, but I suppose um, in the in, in Western Europe, in terms of companies being much more responsive and going elsewhere to uh, to, to build products? And can I ask just another question on that, so we can get um, save time? In terms of there not being an executive here for the last three years. And a failure, obviously, for ministers to make decisions, uh, has that negatively impacted on the construction industry in terms of companies having to go elsewhere because the, those large major contracts, perhaps at the same scale, weren't here in Northern Ireland. Uh, the uncertainty, as well as political uncertainty, was quoted when we did engagement with with industry. That sort of argument was put to us. Uh, very difficult to yeah. quantify that, mm. but it was certainly mentioned. Yeah. And the lack of, you know, the pipeline coming down, pro <coughs> new projects coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Was certainly mentioned to us that, that they weren't coming forward because they weren't getting the approvals because there was no executive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other members? Mr. Banks. Uh, oh. you, you mentioned pipeline. Um, at present, with their. Uh, not being a, a, a central controlling procurement area, um, is there a greater uh, likelihood of sporadic uh, contracts coming to the market? You know, ideally, you want a fairly smooth number of contracts and work coming to the market so that people can continually bid. If there's two big contracts coming at one time, maybe our people decide I'm going to only bid for one type thing. So, is there is there any attempt? Are you aware of is there any attempt to uh, coordinate the with all the different departments the the, the how contracts come to market? Well, uh, I would have thought that was uh, one of the specific roles of the Strategic Investment Board, uh, you know, to make sure the pipeline of projects is smooth and not overly lumpy. So um, I think when the committee is inquiring of the SIB, that that would be a good li line of pursuit. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Mr. Lund. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Chairman. Just one more. Uh, I've been hearing recently about a, a major uh, public body, let's put it that way, uh, which has the potential to give out over the next 10 years about £50 million worth. 50, I forget the figure. It, it's, it's huge, anyway. Um, and they have decided to place far more emphasis on. Uh, when they're risk scoring uh, the tenders on on quality of previous work, uh, I'm, I'm talking I think 60 percent bias as against 40 percent on the price. Is that is that common practice or is that something new? Uh, no, uh, the one that I've been around this a long time and getting trade-offs between price and quality. Yeah. Uh, it absolutely depends on what you're procuring. Uh, it's a simple product or a complicated service. So, um, so depending on what it is, uh, there will be a different mix of prices. So if it's a straightforward 
standard product. Uh, I would mm. say uh, prices should be predominant. But uh, if it's a complicated service delivery thing, then you would expect quality to feature more prominently. Uh, and I think judgments will be different. In, in each, and you would expect, in each case, careful judgment to be made rather than some sort of working to a standard formula. It's, uh, it's the type of work would be um, loosely described as maintenance work. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the area I'm talking about, which I don't really want to name, um, there, there is a history of very poor quality of work. And that's why they're, they're, they're thinking about going this way. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me if, that, if, that, if that's the case, uh, because we have, even at this committee and its predecessor, examples where we talked about uh, work in a competitive market, work being priced too low, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, firms getting to, to difficulty, quality suffering. So, uh, <coughs> and then it's important those on the other side that are assessing contracts. You know, uh, uh, look very carefully at the quality dimension as well as the price. Okay, Ms. Flynn. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you um, for the the presentation. I was just wondering, um, Kieran and Tomas, whenever you were compiling this piece of work, I think David had um, alluded to it earlier on. Outside of the briefing paper we were given earlier on, was making comparisons to the south of Ireland and Britain, but outside of Britain and Ireland. Are you aware of any other models of best practice where they seem to get this right outside of these islands? I guess uh, they'd be helpful if there was an outstanding model <laughs> that could direct the executive towards. Uh, I'll be honest, on this particular piece of work, we didn't look, you know, across. Sometimes we do look to places like Australia and elsewhere. In this case, we didn't. Uh, we had a fairly tight frame of reference. Um, all I can say, I think I said it before, in, in these islands, uh, you know, all, every jurisdiction has experienced problems with major projects. Uh, the big innovation uh, across in, in England has been the, the creation of a major projects authority, or they uh, deal with mega projects to, to harness skills and expertise in, in one place, and have strong project management disciplines very rigorous training for project managers and that sort of thing. Mm. So th there's definitely learning from other places, uh, and um, there's no doubt about that. Hey, Just one wee quick follow-on, Chair. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the construction industry is unit price yes, but um, and besides all the problems we have, all the, uh, the processes, is, is it the case of the regulations, or are these projects have to be gold-plated. I mean, in terms of that, or are we following good practice and regulations as opposed to? Well, that, that is something actually was mentioned in the SAB report um, when it came that you know there is a tendency when these projects are managed by departments there can be a tendency to gold-plate yeah. some of these projects, and there needs to be more thinking about how mm. you know when it's managed by one department maybe. A couple of departments could get together and have mm -hmm. multi-use buildings. I mean, I'm not judging that. I'm only throwing that out as a question. Uh, the other point, I just because they said roughly 700 million um, ish, mm -hmm. but I, I'd like a, a true reflection between the the actual optimum bias and what the actual difference would be. Could can we get any figures? Or you may not have to answer now. Or maybe it's. Something for the research. I don't think, I think it's fair to ask the answer now. To say, oh no, I wouldn't, no, wouldn't be asked. Yeah. I'm only saying just yeah. the difference. Could, yeah, I, you, but yeah, because we just make the point because I think that's every member we indicated has spoken, um, um, and we'll bring this session to end. But just that make if it would be possible to get the cumulative figure across the eleven major projects mm -hmm. we're talking about here, that would be helpful to us. Yeah. Do appreciate some of them are live and their sensitivities and all of that, but as much as you can, please, that would be. Uh, something I think we would all be interested in seeing. Yes. Okay. Do that. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, members. This is the Northern Ireland. Okay, members. So, item nine is an inquiry into major capital projects. This is a briefing from the Construction Employers Federation, uh, pages 132 to 136. Members, please see the biographies 
of our guests, 133 to 134, and a briefing paper from the Construction Employers Federation at 135 to 136. Uh, I would like to welcome Mr. Mark Spence, Assistant Director, and Mr. John Cockey, Federation Manager of the Construction Employers Federation. Both very welcome, gentlemen, and Thank I'll you. hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll kick off. Um, first off, I'd like to uh, thank you for your invitation to attend the committee um, representing the construction industry in Northern Ireland. Uh, according to published NISRA figures, uh, construction is the second largest economic sector in Northern Ireland, directly employing around 35,000 people and supporting jobs of many more beyond uh, direct construction activity. It is estimated that every, for every one pound spent in construction creates value close to three pounds to the economy, as well as many non-economic benefits of enhancing the built environment. The Construction Play Employers Federation CEF, is the certified representative body for the construction industry in Northern Ireland and has been representing members' interests for 75 years. The CEF has over 800 member companies, ranging from micro-businesses employing a handful of people uh, to the largest construction companies operating in Northern Ireland. In total, CEF member companies account for over 70 per cent of construction output in Northern Ireland. So, as a membership organisation, a significant part of our role would be uh, to handle member concerns about procurement, both in general terms and in relation to specific tendered opportunities. Due to members wishing uh, to build and retain relationships with procuring bodies, they often prefer CEF to raise these on their behalf uh, so that concerns are non-attributable and avoid any sense of confrontation. Okay. Just to develop the role that CEF performs, uh, whilst we don't uh, take up individual member concerns that would give one construction company an advantage over another, what we do is we take up points of principle that members raise with us on their behalf. Uh, in relation to tenders and procurement, and that the outcomes of those will then benefit all members equally. Uh, as such, the CEF has invested considerable time and effort over the years, working in very good and close cooperation with CPD and the various procurement and statutory bodies towards improving procurement practice and outcomes. This engagement has generally been very positive, and it has produced better outcomes uh, for all parties to date. However, there remain several fundamental themes upon which the CEF uh, continue to support the case for reform in public procurement. Uh, these would include a more streamlined and realistic planning process and assumptions. Uh, this tends, and the Audit Office report highlighted, to be the most frequent cause of delays in major capital procurements. We would also support more transparent and robust budgeting, with a particular emphasis on deliverable and multi-year budgets. Uh, we would support more appropriate risk transfer within construction contracts and the minimisation of the use of customised clauses uh, in individual contracts. Uh, we would seek consistency of procurement policy and practice across the entire public sector, as this would enhance the confidence uh, for local SME businesses. Uh, and we would also look forward to that less adversarial approach to contracting, uh, which we think can be achieved by earlier and open engagement with the construction community. Uh, Federation welcomes this opportunity to brief the committee as it is considering the Audit Office's report. Uh, and in general terms, we are very supportive of the findings of that report. Um, we are very happy to take questions at this point, or we had submitted a brief paper if you wanted us to go through that paper, whatever, whatever suits the committee best. Uh, we are available um, for questions. How long will you, you take to go through the paper? I can be through the paper in a, about five minutes. You carry on doing Okay, that. we'll carry on. So in general terms, then, the, the Federation did meet with the Audit Office in January of last year, uh, and our comments, as covered by them in the report, raised a number of issues uh, which we believe strongly affect the timing and delivery of major capital projects uh, from the industry's point of view. Some of these are not exclusive to Northern Ireland. These, are, these can be uh, problems in other jurisdictions, but we believe that some of them are more acute. The first of these uh, I want to discuss is, is budgetary issues. The uh, practice to date of one-year capital budgets does not serve the construction industry and it does not serve construction clients in terms of delivery. Um, it does not facilitate uh, transparency uh, for medium or long-term planning. The focus on flagship projects within budgets was very important. The government highlights and prioritises flagship projects. There needs to be a realisation that this puts significant pressure uh, on clients uh, to deliver the remainder of their infrastructure within a very limited capital expenditure uh, budget. 
when you add to that as well that the uh, less than a third of the overall number went on construction in terms of budgets, uh, other items are included in capital budgets which do not result in actual construction. And the impact of construction inflation in recent years, we are actually running at probably a lower level of capital investment now than we were over 10 years ago. Moving on to uh, delivery timescales, a uh, major criticism construction would have is the substantial time lags. Uh, schemes have to go through a procurement process beginning an outline business case, going forward to pre-qualification and then tendering. That can be a lengthy process, uh, but the market is always alert to it and is tracking these uh, future opportunities. But there can be substantial time lags even when a tender uh, is awarded and the time then to being on site. Again, this causes problems for contractors who are planning uh, to avail of the opportunity to tender for these projects and are resourcing towards these projects in terms of uh, their employment uh, and plant and finance resources. There can be a variety of reasons for these. We've already touched upon budgetary availability, which can be a reason for delay. Um, but it, it is very unnerving for the confidence of the construction sector when projects which appear to be awarded do not go ahead. Uh, linked to that, the, the industry would have concerns about the validity of the uh, procurement pipeline. Uh, very often the feedback from our members would be that we are presenting them with static pipelines and these are not helpful. Unfortunately, the pipeline is not the problem, it's reflecting the state of procurement and budgetary constraints. Uh, it would be helpful if pipeline could be uh, aggregated for all budget holders in the public sector uh, and not, not simply those under the investment strategy. Uh, that would give greater visibility and instill more confidence in the construction sector. Moving on to procurement and staffing. Uh, as was previously identified in the CBIs and SIBs uh, work in 2012 to 14 and subsequently in the OECD report and most recently this audit office support, uh, we would concur that there is a need for uh, the enhanced professionalisation and centralisation uh, within public procurement in Northern Ireland. Uh, we recognise the duplication uh, of procurement across several entities and we believe this is spreading what is a, a professional service too thin. We believe more value and effectiveness could be achieved by concentrating resources, professionalism and expertise uh, in one body. Uh, there have been a number of procurement failures in, the, in recent years and setbacks and these are highlighted in the audit office report but these again reduce confidence in local construction companies to tender for local works. And we believe very much the centralisation, reduction in duplication and the more consistent approach to procurement across all public sector bodies would, would make the best use of limited resources. We recognise the transfer of health projects under CPD uh, was successful, but the SIV did highlight other areas of public expenditure uh, to also migrate to CPD and we would regard this as an area to be reinvigorated and looked at again. In terms of risk transfer, uh, very often when it comes to tender stage documents, uh, contractors are presented with documentation that is either incomplete or requires too great a transfer of risk to the contractor. Uh, this can lead to contractors withdrawing from procurements, uh, and there is a report out today from the CBI where that is one of the recommendations that where that transfer of risk is too great, uh, their recommendation to contractors is don't contract, find a different contract. Uh, that obviously presents problems for clients seeking to have a competitive tender. Our view would be that the, the more that contracts can be standardised and the reduction in customisation of clauses, uh, the greater consistency and the greater appetite there will be to tender. We've gone to legal challenges. Uh, Members will be aware Northern Ireland is noted to be particularly litigious uh, in terms of construction contracts. Our view on this is that perhaps the bar for taking legal challenge in Northern Ireland is rather too low and that might be uh, subject to review and we're aware the audit office may be looking at that. Um, it is fair on the other hand to say that not all legal challenges are vexatious in nature. Some of them are well founded and some of them are upheld so it, it is too broad a sweep to say that construction is litigious for the wrong reasons. There are often good reasons. Uh, and that, that's been upheld in a number of judgments. Um, it is not an easy area uh, for construction to resolve. Uh, we would be looking to the legal processes, perhaps, to, to assist in how this can be rationalised. We'd be very keen to work towards improving any adversarial relationships. Uh, we think that can be done, again, by early engagement with contractors. Uh, the final point we wish to make, then, is the general point in terms of planning. And, again, 
we understand this is near the audit office we'll be looking at in more detail. But major capital projects obviously require significant commitment from bidders to tender. Uh, Six-figure sums are far from unusual as the cost of bidding. Uh, and again, this will impact the appetite of bidders for larger projects if they perceive a risk that planning won't be achieved uh, in a timescale that's uh, professed or reasonable. So to summarise, uh, building on the Audit Office's report and the work of the CBI and SIB uh, as referenced, we believe there are a number of issues that can be addressed to improve confidence and delivery in, in construction. The introduction of robust multi-year budgets and greater clarity regarding pipelines, uh, greater clarity and certainty with regards to planning, centralisation of built environment procurement and delivery, appropriate sharing and transfer of risk within contracts to help reduce challenge, and possibly uh, looking at alternative uh, models of funding uh, and making use, for example, of financial transaction capital to leverage extra funding into certain areas of public sectors to allow uh, greater delivery of pipeline. Uh, CF has a very good long-standing relationship with government here to drive improvement in efficiency and procurement and delivery of capital projects and ensure maximum benefit is delivered from the public expenditure. We're very keen to engage on the next phase of reform, which we believe is essential to ensure effective delivery for all end users in the public sector and beyond. And we appreciate the opportunity today to add our voice to that of the Audit Office report in seeking vital reform in some of these areas. Okay, thank you both very much. And we really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, it's very helpful. Um, can I just ask for bring members in? In terms of the um, procurement board, are you asked to sit on it? We, we are not represented on the secure, uh, procurement board. Uh, there would be a member of ours who is on that board, but she's also sitting in private capacity. Yeah, but but as a federation, you're not approached. No. You think that would be helpful? As you are? It, that would possibly be helpful. It's always good to have a voice around the table. As I say, there there are good voices around that table. Anyway, I understand uh, sometimes if the uh, the remit of a, a set committee is too large, there may be too many voices. Mm. But uh, we would certainly step step up if we were invited. We'd, we'd be happy to join and have our voice there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hildich. Thanks, Chair, and good afternoon, gentlemen. You're very, very welcome indeed. Just on your section on sort of procurement and the risk areas, uh, an indication that the, the, the risk level is too, too much to carry, uh, and it's indicating that some uh, people aren't, aren't going to submit tenders for certain contracts. Uh, could you give us maybe some examples or some ideas about what that actually entails? And, the type of risk that is being transferred and, and, and why it is too much? Okay. So the, at the high level, the, the, the biggest risk to construction is the, the actual time scales and the, the deliverability of projects. As I say, the, the, uh, the start of the, the uh, evaluation is when the tender documents are released and companies will evaluate the opportunities. And if there is uncertainty around the deliverability or there are question marks around the project or its support to go forward or the budgets to be available, um, there will be a reluctance to commit significant resources to preparing to bid, bids and tenders going forward. Um, there are also issues around sometimes scope change. And we note in the audit office report that was one of the, the second or third highest reasons for delays and extra costs is we would call it scope creep in projects where after pricing a job, uh, the client makes uh, repetitive changes to their requirements throughout the project. And whilst those could be regarded as additional work, they, they invariably cost uh, the contractor money uh, to deliver, and they will incur delay, uh, which if a contractor has a portfolio of projects will have knock-on impacts to other contracts they may be delivering. So it's not, not desirable for the scope to change throughout the project. And does that type of issue get fed back through the various strands of procurement here in Northern Ireland? Certainly that, that will be fed back. Uh, it will be fed back in real time uh, to the procuring authorities um, and it will be fed back in our interactions with... So they'll be very the, much aware of that? They'd, they'd be aware of that. Um, at the same time, we have to appreciate it as time develops and particularly when you're working in sensitive areas like health where there's constantly changing requirements. So mm -hmm. 20 years ago, we'd have been building hospitals with wards of eight and ten patients and today the move would be towards single rooms with ensuite facilities so it's a, there can be reasons for change for other very legitimate reasons and construction has to be a, available to to mend the, the, the around those changes um, but to be aware those invariably will add cost and delay there's no doubt about that so the more that the project can be defined 
before it is on site. But risk level comes down then? Yeah. Other risk elements, uh, just in, in generic terms, would be uh, taking, for example, ground risks. Uh, mm -hmm. so what was that? Taking ground risks, so you, you'd be uh, expected to build on the site and you may or you may not be provided with complete information regarding, for example, contamination and so on. If those reports are not complete, the bidder will have to take an assumption of risk around what may be found on the site. Mm -hmm. They may price that risk high, in which case it's not good value for the public purse, or they'll take a, take a go at <coughs> pricing it low because they want to be competitive to win the bid. That can equally produce problems down the line if a, a large cost occurs, which they have not got covered off in the contract, and that puts them at risk. Now, we would not like to see that. We'd rather see uh, very comprehensive information provided with the tender documents, but invariably on occasions that that is not always possible or, or available to the bidders. <coughs> understand contamination. I've been dealt with a few of those myself, but would also his historic sites can lead to delay as well, would that be right? In yes, I mean, archaeological finds and so on uh, can always be right. risks. Yes. So there, there's two routes for the public sector. They can actually either do all of the reports themselves and self-indemnify that if they haven't found something, or they can ask the bidders to do those same reports. That would be poor value for money in our view, because you then have six or more bidders all incurring the same expenditure to get the same reports. Um, whilst those are costs incurred by the contractor, naturally they're going to have to recoup them at some stage in some other way, in some other contract, so ultimately it's coming out yeah. of the value I for think money. That's interesting. The, the CBI report today has come out supporting those? Yes, I had a quick read of it this morning uh, and it does resonate very much in terms of risk transfer. And as I say, their, their recommendation is if there's too much risk transfer, bidders should walk away. That sits well if you're in GB mm -hmm. or in Dublin. We don't have sufficient number of contracts in this jurisdiction that bidders have the choice. And bidders are wanting to keep their workforces busy locally. They feel obliged to tender locally, and sometimes they will take a risk uh, to win yeah. the work. I just, as I said earlier, where it's, too, it's been a risk to carry for contractors. But well, what can be done overall, from, in your view, to, to improve that situation then? I think a lot of this comes down to standardisation of approach. So it depends on which client you're procuring with the level and the detail of information that will be provided. Um, and also various contracts will have, we would call them carve-out clauses, but they will be risk transfers. Um, we did have an example recently where there was a, a, an attempt to remove a risk which would have absolved bidders of a change in law, uh, which is a normal a normal clause in a contract, because if the government changes a law which has a financial impact, well, that's not been within the control of a bidder, so the bidder should not be uh, should not be out of pocket for that. But in the year where Brexit is being negotiated, and we don't know the outworkings of that and the impact that that could have on contractors, is it fair for contractors to carry that risk, which is a change in government uh, legislation, which they have no control over and actually at the moment no visibility over? Uh, the CPD quite rightly reinstated that change of law clause, and we, we appreciate them doing that. But that would be indicative of the type of risk transfer where bidders were coming to us as members confidentially and saying, we cannot bid for that contract if that clause is removed because we're, you're asking us to take on the risk too far. So there's a balance of risk, and contractors do take risk. Contractors take the full risk of managing their own sites, health and safety on sites, vandalism, all of the usual things over which you'd expect them to have control, and they have experience of control. But when you start asking them to take on risks over which they have no control, they have no choice either to price it very high in case it happens, or they're going to go in without cover, and then should it happen, they may find themselves in difficulty, and ultimately the project could be in difficulty. And could I ask maybe a more controversial question in relation to risk, and that of any paramilitary or criminal type involvement on site? That wouldn't feature in conversations we have with bidders. It does not seem to be uh, a present concern. Um, we, can, we can't say more than that. It's not something that would reach our table in terms of members' concerns. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, very much for your presentations. Um, I was going to declare an interest, Chair. A number of my brothers have been in the construction industry for years, so I feel their pain at times. Um, but I just want to I, I want to just pick up on. on some of the issues that, that I've dealt with, even as a public rep, the, the planning side of things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it can be seriously problematic for all. Yes. And, and uh, hopefully, at the end of this process, we might try and, try and address some of those issues. But you talked about additional guarantees regarding speeding up the planning. Um, could you, would you like to expand on that, or is there 
any other better practices, say in Ireland or across the UK, that you could maybe suggest that? Yes, I mean, speed up the process. To be fair, we we haven't benchmarked against other other processes available. Um, simply, what we can reflect is members' frustrations with the current planning processes. And yes, we we hold up the question: uh, Is it possible to give guarantees? We, we know it isn't. It's never possible to give ultimate guarantees. Um, I think one of the concerns we would have at the moment as a federation is with the uh, devolution of planning to local council areas. Mm -hmm. Our members would report that different councils have different processes in place, different speeds of process, mm -hmm. and are actually in the, uh, in the early stages now of developing individual sets of guidance notes. That would concern us simply from the point of view of, again, we are creating massive duplication in the planning system and variation in the planning system. So whereas in the past there was one planning service, and if you were uh, interested as a developer in construction, you knew how that worked, uh, we're now potentially looking at variation between councils and between their policies and their guidance notes. And it will take a very, uh, a very wide view from a, a developer to understand the, the nuances and the differences, and they'll have to become acquainted with those at some cost to themselves, and that, that seems to us not to be a, a very efficient development in terms of planning. Uh, in terms of the planning for major capital projects, again, it's always difficult to anticipate objectors, and there, there are valid objections to planning, and that's why the process is there, and we do appreciate that. From a contractor's point of view, I suppose we would prefer to either be involved early in projects and maybe assist mm -hmm. the authorities to allay the fears of those raising concerns about some developments. Uh, or equally, that uh, when the projects are brought to market, that they, they are at a, a highly advanced stage of planning and that there's little further risk of objection that could delay the projects. But at the moment, we seem to be engaged at a point where objections appear uh, whilst we're engaged as bidders. Uh, and that's a cost and a delay. And what you will find on occasions is that a bidder will have to take another commercial opportunity elsewhere to keep their business going. And when the planning is finally approved on the original project, they're not available to do it anymore, and they may withdraw their interest, which is detrimental to the authority, obviously, as well. No, and I, and I just want to further develop that because, I mean, let, let's take the major contact you're saying about you find out uh, at a point in the conversation or application that objectors are holding the whole process up. And why I'm asking you is, I mean, you're at the front line of it. You know what's going on. You're, so. It's just at times, even when, I, when I'm discussing or supporting an application, it's those people on the ground who can bring some of the ideas to the fore. And that's part of our job. Like, just we had a briefing from planning service, and we can bring those issues. All I'm saying to you is we're learning from you what you're experiencing, and I'm only giving you the opportunity to even you consider as a federation putting stuff on paper to, you know what I mean? Yes, no, it, it, it's, a, it's a very urgent topic for a lot of our members, and they, they bring it up. Um, we, we note the audit office are preparing to do a review as right. well. And, and that's the reason, and that's the major yes. one. But I want to just go back to the council one, because there's a pod process there, mm -hmm. pre-application discussion. Are you saying to me now, I know some of them work OK, yes. and there's no guarantees in relation to once you no. sit down, but, but all I'm saying to you, uh, in your experience and the Federation's experience in dealing with pods, I mean, is there anything else you, you know, can say? Or, or the, the experience of members would simply be the, the variable timescales in, in yeah. different areas. It, the inconsistency right inconsistency. across. There's no consistency right across the, the 11 council models. Uh, and that, that might be a matter of resources more than anything else. We, we don't know. But uh, members would have council areas where they say, oh, I'll get that achieved much quicker in this area than that area. And that will actually perhaps skew where they choose to develop in, in, in some cases as well. No, no, I appreciate it. It's just I know I'm, I'm dealing with planning applications nearly, nearly every week. Just, just a wee question, because uh, it's quite interesting. I remember one time they were doing a road over in Fermanagh and they found the, the famous drum clay crano. Not a lot of people know, but, but in terms of the uh, archaeological thing, is, is there, um, and it's just something for consideration, because I'm sure somewhere on a map there's sites of some description being identified. It's not just buildings or. Um, and that's something maybe the question should be asked mm -hmm. as part of the conversation because it's definitely go and dig up a road and you find something underneath. Yes. But but clearly the site's identified in the old records and maybe some maybe something you should you should have a conversation about because you're going in on the safest delays when you have to do mm -hmm. some digs. So I, I I would be asking some of the departments or some of the 
historical sites or something, whatever it is, there's a question about. Just one final question in relation to planning. Um, and it's something come up when we we done the planning act in 2011. Would you be in favour of fast track planning for the, the, some of the major projects, or or not? Or it's probably not our view to have a view, if you like, on, on the the actual process. I mean, from our members' point of view, the important thing is there would be a clear process. It would be a transparent process, and that the timescales were more certain. And whether that's a long or a short process. I'll not say it doesn't matter to construction. The important thing for us is almost the, the reliability of the process and the certainty of an outcome. Um, if it's fast-tracked and it's proper and all the correct opinions are sought and all of the correct representations are made, it certainly would, it would be attractive to bring projects to the market quicker, um, provided it was a robust outcome. No, and, and they asked it in the context of I mean, the system being, I, it has to be properly done. Yes, you know, and, and processed all of the same as as part of the the experiences through the fed, the federation. Sorry, the um, you learn every day. You learn every every contract you learn. So, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, chair. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Thank you, chair. Um, on the legal issue. You say the bar for taking legal challenges in Northern Ireland is quite low. Why do you think this is the case, and how does it compare to other jurisdictions? Um, the sheer number of challenges that are raised would suggest to us that it's, it's perhaps too easy uh, a route for uh, a disenchanted bidder to take. Um, what we would find is that, again, the relative paucity of opportunities out there for construction means that bidders are highly competitive, and the need for work drives their, their approach, and the loss of a contract, which will not readily be replaced by another contract, because we don't have that many opportunities, can drive them to, to challenge simply on the basis of, if it's relatively low cost to them to raise the challenge, it's worth a go if it over, overturned a, a result and gave them another opportunity. Um, it's not an avenue we believe bidders go down lightly. But nevertheless, we think on occasions it, it's rather too easily triggered. Okay. okay. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, Mr. Beggs. Back to the procurement issue again that Mr. Hillage started with. Um, do you think that the public sector procurement staff lack particular skills and experience, which actually, if was there, would be um, advantageous to everybody, um, so that there would be a successful procurement process? Um, um, you mentioned earlier about um, knowing the ground conditions, for example. So, so it, are some conditions perhaps been put in which uh, poses unnecessary risks on some occasions, which results in higher costs? Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you for that. I think, I think the two points in there. The, the first point would be, uh, in our experience across the, the field public sector, that there's, there's great professionalism and experience in public procurement bodies. What we would say is that it's spread rather thin, and some of them will have expertise in some areas, and some will have expertise in others, and we see no reason why they couldn't all be combined for the greater good and, and pull all of that experience and professionalism in one body. Uh, we would find bodies who would be stronger in some areas, not so strong in other areas. Members will almost be choosing their sectors by how easy it is to procure work in those sectors, uh, and some sectors will be struggling on occasions to find enough bidders of it interested, and sometimes that's a reflection of their experience in the past. Um, there's good experience in, in the public sector. Uh, we recognise that. It's a very valuable experience. They've, they've done a lot in the last few years in bringing a lot of professional staff in who are highly qualified and highly experienced, and we welcome that. Um, but we would like to see that progress beyond the point it had reached a number of years ago. Uh, Department of Health moved into CPD, and we welcomed that at the time, and the outworkings of that have been positive in the main uh, for the large part of procurement there. Uh, we would very much like to see other bodies moving their procurement divisions under the same umbrella and sharing the expertise. Uh, it would also lead to greater standardisation and consistency, which helps the market understand contracts so that every contract you lift, you don't have to read every single line of it because you know there will be variations in it. 
If there was more standardisation, it would make bidding a more straightforward process. It would reduce costs to bidding, and it would ultimately result, I believe, in better value for money. Um, it does lead on to your other point about risk as well. Um, standardisation of contracts uh, reduces the perception of risk for contractors. It's when uh, authorities start uh, wordsmithing their contracts and adding maybe dozens and dozens of bespoke clauses, all of which a sensible bidder will have to take to a legal advisor to make sure he's interpreting correctly because he's going to be held to them. That's all additional time, cost and a deterrent, frankly, to, to bidding on occasions. Um, so we would wel welcome centralisation of the individuals into one body where the best practice could be shared and standardised uh, and of contractual approaches could equally be standardised. We believe that would be a good uh, mitigation of risk, which would reduce costs and potentially as well legal challenge. You seem to be indicating that the transfer of the health projects to CPD is being perceived as being uh, positive, it's been successful. What makes you think that so far? Um, what, are the, what are the features which make you think it's, it's good, what's happened there? So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not blind to the fact that there are a number of health projects mentioned in the audit office report. Um, I'm very dated, of course. There are, there are a number of reasons uh, for each of those projects, and, and they're well documented there. But in, in general terms, uh, with the Department of Health falling under CPD, uh, for projects of a smaller scale than this, uh, the procurement process has been refined and has become very efficient. And amongst the construction sector, health projects would now be the more popular uh, sector to go after. The procurement process is standardised, uh, it is straightforward, and it works well. And there would be, to my knowledge, relatively few challenges against any of the outcomes uh, procured. Now, these were very large scale capital projects. I appreciate that's the focus. Of, of the report, the audit office, and there are other circumstances in there beyond procurement which caused issues uh, to, to time and delay. Uh, but we do recognise uh, in other scales of project that the, the, the transition of health into CBD has been a very positive move, and we, we believe that could be replicated to other sectors. You mentioned that the, the, project, the process has been standardised. Uh, is that meaning that uh, uh, they're more competitive. Are there more people bidding because it's it's not overly complicated to bid? That's exactly right. I mean, the, the, the threshold for entry is still high, so you're assured of a good quality panel of contractors. But there are many more contractors who, ha having entered onto the uh, the panel, are then called upon to bid, and the bidding process is very straightforward at that point going forward, uh, and it is very popular, uh, much more straightforward and very transparent. Um, Department of Education, uh, or sorry, Education Authority, have adopted a parallel process now. Uh, they were heading off in a different direction, uh, but after consultation with our members, uh, they've uh, adopted the same model the CPD are doing with health, and that is very much welcomed as well. Um, it's a good model. Um, for still the, the very much larger projects, we understand, yes, that there have been issues, um, but we would recognise there are multiple issues with each of the uh, the projects highlighted in this report, they're not all down purely to procurement, and indeed budget does seem to be the, the common factor, at least to all of them. Uh, other factors added on top as well. Okay, thank you, Ms. Flynn. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mark and Jonathan, for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask a question around the time scales. Um, I know there's probably a lot of overlap in your answers as well, but it was just around, um, could you give an example of the substantial time lags between schemes being pre-qualified, tendered and going on site? And I know this is a big question um, as well, but it's just in and around why you think that these delays are happening and how they could be minimised. And there's probably 100 different answers to that. But even if there's anything overarching or in the immediate term that would help with that. Thank you. Okay. So yes, I mean time scales are as variable as the number of projects. But in, in general terms, the, the market becomes aware of a significant project. There would be what's called a pin notice. A prior information notice will be published in the European Journal, and that's simply to flag up to interested parties that this is a project which is in development at the moment. At the next stage, then, it will be a pre-qualification stage, uh, where interested parties are required to put forward, in general terms, their experience and their capability and suitability for the projects, and they will then be shortlisted down to typically six bidders. 
who will be invited then to actually tender for the job, in other terms, to price the job and probably to submit a, a submission of quality alongside the price to demonstrate why they would be the, the right choice. Uh, in general terms, the, the timelines between uh, a PQQ, you would probably allow the, uh, the bidders anywhere between a month and six weeks to complete a PQQ. The authority might then take anywhere again between a month and two months to assess those PQQs before shortlisting and sending out the tender documents. And depending on the, the scale of the project, bidders might be allowed between two weeks or two months, say, uh, to actually price and submit their documents. Uh, from that point then to selecting the preferred bidder uh, will be down to the evaluation panel, but typically a month uh, would be sufficient time. Our problem in the sector is that a lot of projects in the past have got to the PQQ stage. Bidders have been invited to tender and maybe the tender documents don't appear. What happens then is that six months later when the tender documents are finally ready, because maybe for some reason they weren't, you find that of the panel of six you'd shortlisted, four are no longer interested and you, you maybe don't have a, a competitive panel. And what would be the reason for that delay? With because or is it... bidders maybe have, have taken up other opportunities in the meantime. To say that there, there's not such uh, a wealth of opportunity mm. locally, so a contractor will typically bid for anything that he's suitable for. Mm. Now, that, that can go one of two ways. He might win all of them, and then he may need to make a difficult decision that he yeah. can't actually do all of them, or he may win none of them, but he will bid for all of them because mm. he needs the work. Um, I know in the past there have been PQQs which have never resulted in ITTs, mm. which is frustration because of the mm -hmm. time that's spent on the PQQ. It's nothing to the frustration that ITTs sometimes do not result in contract awards, and that's, mm. even, that's a significant investment of time to actually price a contract and to write a qualification. <coughs> there have been instances of that in the, in the recent past. Um, that then, if you like, would be something a, a contractor would be very wary of in the future from the same authority going out again and thinking, well, we spent a lot of time and money on you last mm -hmm. time and you didn't actually award a contract. We're not sure we're going there again. Mm -hmm. That damages reputation. So we're very, very keen to avoid that type of thing. But as I say, I think, I think in, you, you mentioned overarching issues, undoubtedly budgetary constraints, and we appreciate there are severe budgetary constraints are part of the problem. And the fact that we run in annual cycles rather than multi-year budgets. Multi-year budgets are vital for construction. Mm -hmm. the, even the procurement process we've, we've just discussed there takes the majority of a year. And that's before contractors are on the ground to then build a project, which will typically take a year, two, three, four years, depends on the scale of it. Mm -hmm. So you can see how there's little confidence sometimes in bidding for larger projects when we don't have confidence that the budget's been secured and it's not visible. Okay, Mr. McHugh. Uh, Andrew Rolf and Sean Hughes are very welcome here this evening. Uh, and again, just um, many of the issues that you have identified, I think we're fairly aware of them ourselves as well, too, and would hope to maybe in the passage of time address them. But in addition uh, to all these issues that are, uh, are um, in your statement, do you feel that an exit in Europe, that's likely to again either, is it have advantages for the construction industry or is it in fact likely to uh, impose other impediments in that to its development and uh, um, tendering here on the island of Ireland or even in Britain? Uh, obviously a complex range of issues arise uh, from that discussion. Uh, in immediate terms, to date, from our perspective, the impact of Brexit has primarily been around material costs. Uh, so much material in the construction industry is sourced outside the UK and the exchange rate uh, variation, which happened shortly after the referendum result, had a significant impact on input costs, uh, particularly on some materials. A uh, large part that had to be absorbed by the industry because contracts didn't allow the pass through of those. Now that's that's been absorbed. That's been understood. Looking forward. Um, our members would have some concerns again about increases in material costs arising from any sort of tariffs uh, and borders issues and those are far from clear at the moment so it's very hard to, uh, to work out what those would be but we're very wary of those input costs rising again. Uh, migrant labour I know is very significant for some sectors. Um, it's not insignificant in construction but at the moment it's not a pressing issue but as an industry we are relatively optimistic that with the return of the assembly, 
um, more surety of pipeline of work that the level of construction may increase locally. At that point, we are cognizant of the fact that given the, the, the paucity of work over the last number of years, a lot of skilled workers have left the region and are working elsewhere, may not return back, and we could actually have a short shortfall of labour and skilled labour. And there may be a requirement to backfill with migrant labour, and at that point, this could become an acute issue. So to say it's not an issue today does not mean it would not be an issue in 12 months' time, and we need to be very conscious of the impact of that. Other issues that may or may not arise is obviously all of our procurement law is aligned to EU directives currently. Um, we again await to see the outwork, outworkings of the, the Brexit situation, but presumably in the, in the future we do not necessarily have to be aligned to EU directives and there may be discussion around those points and we, we would be very keen to be involved at that stage in those discussions. We would have a concern there that again Northern Ireland is a very small market for a lot of bidders and to make this market more bespoke and more unique and slightly less easy to understand in another market uh, and diverging from standards again probably will only add cost and reduce value for money so we'd have some concerns about divergence from standard practice which works well um, but equally there may be uh, niche opportunities for refinement of processes in procurement uh, and making things rather more streamlined but we just need to be very conscious that we don't actually as we sometimes do in this part of the world, over bespoke things to local requirements. It could actually be a detrimental mm. change. But uh, sitting here today, th there's very little clarity on any of those options. But those would be the, probably in terms of construction, the three main areas, procurement uh, rules, labour and material costs that we would be keeping an eye on and would wish to be involved in discussions on. Uh, I often hear in terms of other industries and so on that were uh, one of the they would cite as an advantage, or not that you will, does or not, uh, of Brexit is that uh, there's like a, a deregulation almost, uh, less a need for um, regulation. And I'm thinking here specifically in terms of uh, employers' rights and health and safety and issues of that nature. Do you think that likely to sort of impact on the construction of the same particular? Certainly, from terms of health and safety, it is only in the interests of construction companies to have the highest standards of health and safety, and Northern Ireland would pride ourselves on those and would be well regarded uh, within the European context in terms of health and safety. Um, I, d I don't think it's in the interests of, of the, the industry to, uh, to deregulate or, or dumb down rules which are to the benefits of employees. The, the industry is struggling to attract employees. We have a skills deficit. We have an ageing workforce. Uh, we are very keen to attract young people. Uh, uh, and others into the industry, so we will be doing everything we can actually to improve conditions. It <coughs> certainly wouldn't be in our interest to take uh, what might be regarded as an opportunity uh, to, to downgrade any of those aspects. That, that would be very detrimental, I believe, to our industry. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Just on that point, uh, what proactively then is the Employers' Federation doing, for example, with the Department of the Economy, local councils and so on, um, in terms of trying to attract young people mm -hmm. to go into the construction industry? Yeah. So a, a particular issue um, we would like to raise, and uh, we, we have meetings uh, to arrange with the Department <laughs> of the Economy, but the apprenticeship levy is still an ongoing concern for our members in the sense that it is a direct tax which leaves their business and does not get returned to them in any shape or form or fashion. That has been a very detrimental impact. Uh, I know it's been <coughs> discussed in this place before, but it's still a live issue. Uh, but in terms of uh, engagement, a, a lot of our members are, are very proactive. Uh, there's very good work is done with uh, education colleges and the universities, apprenticeships and training. Um, we are actively engaged at the moment with the bi-social programme with CPD, uh, where social clauses are attached to public sector contracts to bring in apprentices and trainees. We believe that's a, a very good initiative. We believe we can refine it and actually make it stronger and better and more broad ranging. What we would find is the very large contractors are very, very good at this. They're very good at engaging with their communities and their environments. We have to recognise a lot of our membership, our self-employed uh, businessmen and tradespeople. They don't have the resources. They maybe don't have the experience. They're maybe less confident about engagement in their communities to try and Im improve the process. So. What we're uh, discussing with BiSocial is how to improve that outreach uh, and make sure that everybody in the construction industry has access to information around how to attract uh, new, mm. new uh, people into their businesses. 
and improve them. There is a job of work to be done, frankly, in terms of the uh, perception of construction as a viable career, uh, with the lack of local construction work. Not least schools and parents are probably wary of their children joining the construction industry and thinking the only work they'll get is overseas. Um, we believe if we had a stronger, more viable, more visible pipeline of work locally, mm -hmm. that will greatly enhance our perception as a viable career path. If, if um, we've just heard that potentially there's over these 11 projects that we're going to we've been looking at the last number of weeks, and the inquiries have started now, in terms of it could be up to about £700 million. I have got the exact figure. Uh, that has been um, lost to the economy in the sense that it has been overspent uh, or projects have been delayed. Um, I listened very closely to what you said in terms of planning and in terms of legal challenges and so on, in terms of judicial reviews. But there is a perception out there uh, in Northern Ireland that we are incapable of major projects of delivering them on time and on budget. Why is that? It's not a unique situation to Northern Ireland. Um, I think possibly the problem in Northern Ireland is because we have relatively few large projects. And in the actual fact, what we call a large project in Northern Ireland would not be regarded as a large project in other markets. Because we have relatively few and there have been issues on those few, it probably disproportionately represents performance locally. Certainly, there's not a lack of professionalism or expertise in the procurement arena. Again, back to the point, we feel it just needs to be concentrated uh, under one umbrella uh, and a very clear focus put on projects and the prioritisation of projects. Um, but it's a multi-stakeholder issue. It involves planning right mm. from the outset. It involves delivery. Project management is a very key aspect of that uh, as well in terms of client managing uh, on sites. So the, the, there's a multiple range of stakeholders involved in, in fixing the situation. It may appear uh, slightly unfair to Northern Ireland construction and to Northern Ireland clients. Um, and again, I think that might be a reflection of the, the relative n low number of projects, but the, the high incidence of issues on those projects. But when you look at the audit officer's report and they, they have a nice matrix with ticks against each of the factors, budgetary is the top factor. And I think, again, that's yeah. back to the three years of a lack of an assembly and up to this point never yet having had a multi-year budget to, to yeah. provide that surety. You mentioned multi-year budgets. Can you just expand on that how, to the committee how you feel multi-year budgets would actually help and address some of the problems facing construction industry locally? Mm -hmm. So at the minute when we get annual budgets, um, there is a temptation that the, we, we see it and our clients definitely feel it towards the end of a calendar year when there's three months to go in the, in the next financial year. There will be an outpouring of projects which must be done and must be committed and must be spent because we're at the end of the budget and we don't know what budget we'll get next year. We believe that, that that's typical behaviour in any, any environment where you're given a, a short window of opportunity. If that was a three to five year, if a project slipped by six months, the, the budget would be adjusted. Another project might be inserted which could be, could be efficiently delivered in, in the, the space. Single-year budgets don't allow that flexibility, and what you find is if a, a significant project can't be started in the year, it's abandoned, mm -hmm. and you wait for the next year's budget to be released to see whether or not it can be uh, reinvigorated. And in the meantime, multiple, perhaps inefficient projects will be commissioned simply to spend the budget. Mr. McHugh, do you want to come back in? Thank you, yeah. Chair. Uh, it was yourself, Chair, who raised the issue just that um, stimulated my thought and this about apprenticeships and so on. That, um, I know it's been mooted at the present time that um, quite possibly maybe all apprenticeships that will be delivered through the FE colleges in conjunction with industry, and that uh, other providers uh, currently are, uh, are um, resisting that, and that they feel that uh, for many young people coming forward, that uh, whilst they might not attend the FE college, they would prefer to go through the workshops or directly into the, uh, um, the particular industry of their choice. Uh, do you have an opinion on that in terms of how does that the apprenticeship program should be delivered? Again, I think it's about choice, um, but it's about information as well. Um, we don't believe that Schools Career Service has presented construction as a viable alternative. We do think there there is an inbuilt bias to retaining children in the education system. 
um, which, if you were in the education system, would make complete sense. It's about numbers and it's about delivering education, but construction is a viable alternative career which can start at 16. Um, it does not require uh, children to go to further education, and there's very good work being done in higher level apprentices at the moment in professional construction careers. What we need to see is the invigoration of trades careers as well. And there's some fantastic work being done by, by various uh, bodies, but in the last week or two we engaged with Women's Tech, who are very uh, proactive in getting female representation into traditionally male trades. And uh, I was very caught with, with one of their uh, pieces of information, which they share with schools and with parents, which shows the relative earnings of a young person who might go into a typically might be called a typically female career in hairdressing or, or beautician, and setting that against what they might earn as a plumber or a joiner or a bricklayer, which are not traditional trades, but they shouldn't be ruled out. And I think images like that are very powerful, and they create alternative opportunities, and it, it doubles the potential pool for construction for a workforce. We're only looking at half of the pool. We're not going to get the numbers we need. So construction is ready to embrace the diversity agenda, and a lot of our members are already doing great work on that. I think the resistance to that comes from home. Um, I've also heard other instances where young people who have availed of an apprenticeship opportunity and they're making some of their own money for the first time in their life find that through the benefits system, the benefit recipient in the household, the mother or the father, gets the same amount reduced from the family income. And that puts pressures within the family home then as to whether the young person is allowed to continue with the apprenticeship. That's anecdotal, but I believe it happens. And again, young people are perhaps not getting support from the home environment, even to search out a career, but certainly they will not regard construction maybe as an attractive career. Construction has come a long way. There are a lot of careers in construction now which do not require you to be outside all day and, and doing all of those things. There's a lot of technical skills, there's a lot of IT skills, there's a lot of professional skills, but equally it is a very good career. There are very few people in construction in Northern Ireland who are unemployed. A lot of them may be on planes, may be travelling, but they're occupied, they're well paid, they enjoy their work, and we need to get these messages out to the education sector and into children's homes, frankly. and really reinvigorate the image of the, the industry, and that, that's part of our purpose in CEF, to, to help and do that. Thank you. Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and um, fair play to Mark, and stand up for the industry, because, <laughs> I mean, it hasn't been... I mean, you're right, there, there's jobs out there. I don't, I won't, don't want to get uh, too deep into it, but I feel very strongly about it. There's a career out there. And this thing with semi-skilled and all this, we, we need to get away from the language. Yes. Because, I mean, people are building away and walking away there, and, we just try to pass, we don't pass any remarks some days. But, but that's, that's the way we rant over in relation to the building game. But I, I want to bring it back to the issue about, uh, I'm not making a political point about Brexit, but mm -hmm. what I will say to you is, uh, delay means money, but planning service anything else, and your industry and all these jobs. The, the labour force is a key element to it, and there may come changes to the regulations and everything else. So something maybe the you know the federation needs to look at mm -hmm. because you know it will be part of the delay if we haven't the skill set. But take away the words, we haven't the people who work on these sites and do these jobs because I know for a fact in my own town in my own area most of those tradespeople and they're still good tradespeople <coughs> are gone. Yes, we 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 we're starting we're very close to losing a generation mm -hmm. of tradespeople. Mm -hmm. And, and any, any members who don't, who haven't had experience that, but I certainly in the constituency that I represent, there's a there's a trade deficit in in those skills. Yes. And the other point I just want to finish in chair because I'm, I've seen it in part of, of one of the reports. Innovation is a big opportunity too, mm -hmm. and, and it's gone now from the building game to the construction industry, as we used to call it. But it has moved on a lot, and I would agree with my colleague. Our man now is building a new campus, our FE campus, and I mean I hope that they would seriously look at a, a, you know, a new skill set, for want of a better word, uh, to, look at, to look at your trades, and, and hopefully... Uh, but look, thank you very much. OK. okay. Um, can I just... Uh, you mentioned a number of times in your presentation CPD, uh, and I mean, some of us would have a mixed view on that. We were discussing that earlier, um, in terms of 
at times that costs the public purse money because you have to go to a an approved um, contractor with within the CPD uh, system. Um, is that a frustration for your members? Uh, probably less for us than for the authorities. Uh, from the perception of our members, they, in large part with public sector work, await the tenders, track the tenders when they come out and respond to the tenders. Mm. Um, to the extent that they're familiar with doing that in the CPD manner, it's, it's comfortable for them to bid in that way. Um, when they receive bids from other authorities, which are very bespoke and change constantly from time to time, that requires more effort and more diligence uh, and more cost. Um, so I'm sure CPD, like every organisation, is, is not perfect, and they will know that themselves, and there will be areas for improvement, and we, we meet with them regularly, and we, we discuss improvements that we'd all like to see. But in general terms, the principle of having a centralised body uh, which pulls together as many strands as possible, and I, I recognise in the audit report uh, that infrastructure would be regarded as perhaps more competent across its capabilities uh, and may not be included in that overarching body, but there are certainly other areas which we, we believe would benefit. Yeah. Well, one example, when you made mention, and some members have mentioned the CBI report uh, earlier. Uh, in terms of, take for example, maintenance contracts, I'd be aware of my own constituency that they, for the housing executive, that competitive tendering means that uh, a contractor will go in and put in a quote to secure the business, but it's not actually deliverable. Mm. And when it comes to actually do the work, they can't afford to do the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not name the area, but in one, one occasion over a two-year period, the housing executive had about three uh, contractors doing the work, and the staff had all to be two paid across, mm -hmm. which is obviously very concerning for the staff, the, the, the people who work there. Um, doesn't provide security of employment and whatever. Um, and in fact, a friend, a friend of mine who secured one of those contracts actually was one of the people who had to walk away from them because he just could not make it uh, pay. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that an example of a public body driving down the cost so much in terms of that competitive process that it actually delivers, if delivers is the right word, a poor so service to, to people in this case? were tenants of the housing executive. Okay, so there's a number of ways of looking at that. Um, from a construction perspective, I would say the initial threshold, and I'm not talking in specifics about that example, in general terms, this, the threshold for entry to the tender process needs to be robust. Um, we were discussing earlier about potentially you know, bringing six bidders forward. Those six bidders need to be uh, subject to proper due diligence to make sure that they are viable uh, and capable to deliver the service. Um, there are uh, that would be one of the areas where there's variation, let's say, between public bodies in the level of diligence that's applied at that stage. Um, we would support very strong due diligence at that stage to make sure the field of competitors is, is worthy. The other point to say is, in a contract like that, and there are many like it, they are long-term contracts. So for that contractor to miss an opportunity for that client means they're out in the cold for f three to four to five years before that opportunity comes around again. It's important to them to secure that work and they will take a commercial decision to secure it. On occasions they will price it where it's I have to say, having worked in the private sector for 16 years, if the way some contractors or subcontractors work for those who secure contracts from government were to operate like that in the private sector, which you will know well. They wouldn't, they wouldn't get a contract for the second year, never mind. And, and that brings me to, I think, the main point in regards to any of these contracts around project management and contract management. Uh, most of these contracts do contain KPIs. Bidders will be aware of the KPIs in terms of what they have to, the, the achievement of certain standards throughout the contract, and they should price accordingly. And if they can't deliver to that standard, it is a contract management issue then to seek improvement or remove at the, at the opportunity in the contract. Yeah. Um, certainly, we would, we would not uphold people going in at low prices and delivering no quality because it brings everybody into disrepute. So two aspects here. I think that the bar needs to be realistic but high enough to make sure that 
you have a good, robust range of bidders in the first place who price it. But having priced it, they need to be uh, I think, under I think to be fair to those management. companies, though, it, their, their quotes are driven down because of the competitive, the competitive um, nature of them. And, and one of the way one of an out, one of those outcomes can be that substandard products could be used, that service isn't good, that people are brought in who are alleged to be uh, people with the trade and not, but because you simply can't afford to pay for a tradesman, so a labourer gets the job. Yes. Look, thank you both very much indeed for your time, Sapra. I really appreciate it and uh, very helpful to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, members, uh, we now move to closed session for the remaining.